Hello and welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Christy Griswinski, and I am Technical Group Director with SQFI. Uh, before I hand it over to our speaker, let me give you a few updates, real quick updates. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to register for the 2019 SQS conference. It'll be held November 5th through 7th in San Antonio, Texas. Bring your cowboy boots. Uh, for program information and to register, visit the website, which is right there on the screen, sqfi.com. We hope to see you there. Next up, I always like to share this information about the FMI Foundation Scholarship Program. SQFI, in partnership with the FMI Foundation, our parent organization, uh, each year awards 15 scholarships to students expressing interest in food systems auditing as a career path. And who wouldn't want to be a food safety auditor, right? We are now taking applications for the 2019-2020 school year on online via the foundation website. As a reminder, these are $3,000 scholarships for those undergraduate or graduate students in North America with a keen interest in food systems auditing. Uh, in addition to the money, they also uh, are awarded a trip to the SQF conference to meet those 800, 900 attendees at the SQF conference, including you. The deadline is September 13th, uh, next month. So, uh, you know, don't forget, pass this along to nieces, nephews, uh, anyone you know who is uh, currently in a university program in North America, interest with, in food systems auditing. Um, I always forget to put the website up there. So if you do a quick Google search for FMI Foundation Scholarship, uh, it'll it'll pop right up, um, but it should be fmi.org slash scholarship if I'm not mistaken. So don't forget about that. Please be sure be sure to share that. Uh, as a reminder, I always like to uh, tell you that SFI offers a variety of in-person and online training tools to help you implement and advance your food safety and quality program. Visit the SQF website sqfi.com to see the class or classes offered by our licensed training centers. So these are the ones that are offered by our uh, in instructor-led form by our training centers. We also offer a variety of classes, uh, courses, through our training provider, Alchemy Systems. And you can see those here. And without further ado, I want to hand this over to Claire. Before I do that, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat box. Some of you have found it. If you have any questions for Claire, be sure to chat them in there. I'll collect them, and uh, we'll, I'll read out a couple questions to Claire at the end, depending on how much time we have. Um, and if there's any specific questions that maybe I could answer, you can pop those in there and I can answer them real quick. Otherwise, I'll save the specific food fraud ones for, for Claire to address at the end. And again, without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it over and introduce it to Claire Winkle. Go ahead, Claire. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Um, so today we'll be talking about the food fraud toolbox and the weapons you need to fight food fraud. So um, I, last year at the SQF conference I talked about a specific case study for turmeric, food fraud. Um, so I'll touch upon that, but in this topic um, it's really about the nitty gritty of how do you meet the requirements, particularly of the SQF standard, and help you pass your audit. And then, um, even more importantly, help your company um, minimise the risk to food fraud, or at least identify where they potentially could have an issue. So, I work in Australia for a small company called Integrity Compliance Solutions, and we too provide training, both um, what we call virtual as well as face-to-face -face instructor-led training. 
Um, and we work all around the Pacific area. And so recently I was working in a country north of Australia called Papua New Guinea. And I still um, audit for SQF. Spent most of the uh, month of May doing that, month of June. Okay, so um, I'll start with the really basics of what is food fraud because the legal definition of food fraud is different in different countries. So that is something to be aware of that um, if you're exporting to another country, what is their definition of food fraud? And a, the same product can be legal in one country and illegal in another. So food fraud is economically motivated adulteration. So it's all about the money. It's not about malicious contamination. It's not about staff sabotage. It's about money and how to make more of it but with less. It's not about HACCP, which is, as we all know, the prevention of unintentional or accidental food safety adulteration based on science and usually foodborne illness. It's not PASIP, which is threat assessment critical control point, which is about food defence. And that is where the sabotage and malicious contamination and bioterrorism and the like falls. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the prevention of intentional adulteration and that's about following the money and see who's making the money and you'll probably see who's doing the fraud. And it's not new. If we have a look at some of the books that have been written, the earliest one I've found was from 1820, written by a German guy, and that's called The Treaties of Adulteration of Food and Culinary Poisons. So these older books from the 1800s and early 1900s are available on Google because um, they're copyright finished. So if we go down and see the one, Detection of Common Food Adulterants, which was written by a British guy in 1907, some of my um, clients here have downloaded that book because some of the methodologies are still useful today. It's basically really low-tech chemistry that you can do to identify common adulterants. And unfortunately, some of those common adulterants are still in use today. So The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, which is the image you've got there, it was written about the Chicago meatpacking industry. And um, he wrote it, well, it exposes a lot of aspects of that one in terms of occupational health and safety, bullying, sexual harassment, the like, but particularly food fraud. So everybody in the food industry should read that one. The Fast Food Nation one is written about the American fast food chains, the supply chains. Um, not explicitly about food fraud, but certainly an interesting one to see about how different things can happen within the supply chain. And Poorly Made in China is not explicitly about the food industry, but it's about uh, the subcontracting manufacturing industry in China. So that also is quite interesting, particularly from a cultural point of view. So what do we really have to do about it? First, read your SQF standards and know the regulations in the countries that you produce your food in and where you sell the food. As I said, those regulations could be quite different. Read the fine print in your customer standards because often I certainly know the supermarkets here in Australia want more over and above what is in any regulation, whether that be here or the US. And then understand where the risk really lies in the, in the real world to your business. Um, and I've certainly carried out quite, probably now in excess of 600 risk assessments um, for food fraud for different industries. And some of them have found, identified they actually have very little risk and some have identified they have some really significant risks. So there's a couple of different parts of SQF we need to be looking at. The first part is in um, module two, the manufacturing section. So clause 245, 2445, the site's food fraud vulnerability assessment, <coughs> including your particular site susceptible to raw material or ingredient substitution, mislabeling, dilution or counterfeiting, impacting food safety. This is an interesting situation. Under module two, all of the food fraud requirements relate to food safety. Um, so under 2446, there has to be a mitigation plan. So 245, you're doing the risk assessment. 2446, 
you're doing the plan to control any identified hazards um, or vulnerabilities. And 2721 is very similar to 2445. And then saying 2722 is very similar to 2446. And then under 2723, you have to test that mitigation plan annually and review it. So that's something that lots of people haven't been doing in the audits that I've done recently. They all ran around last year and did their um, vulnerability assessment, put a mitigation plan in process, and then put it away and didn't look at it again. So remember that, everybody. You need to be going back, checking it, reviewing it, updating it. Now, the other part um, is the quality code. So if you're taking the vulnerability, uh, you're take, undertaking the voluntary quality code, and most people in Australia who have SQF certification do, you also then have to look under 2711, have a food defence plan that includes the prevention of actions that could adversely affect product quality. 2712, a food forward mitigation plan shall be developed and implemented so that the food forward vulnerabilities impact food quality should be controlled. And that's really important because as we'll see, lots of the issues in food fraud actually don't have a food safety aspect, but they all have a product quality aspect. So this is the top 10 list of frauded, most frauded products in the world. Now it comes from the EU in 2013, but I can tell you olive oil never leaves the number one spot, it's always there. Seafood's always in the top five, as is organic food. So some of them might change around year to year or from US to the EU, but it's pretty well the same top 10 year to year. We've just recently in the UK see, seen some cases of fake saffron, the endless supplies of fake chili around the world, that one's always on the list. So I'll go through some of these. If you have specific questions about any of these particular products, just send a message and put your email address and I'll let you know because I've got case studies on all of them. Okay, so olive oil is one we're going to look at because it's got a lot of interesting twists to it. Every single, almost seemingly every month there's a new olive oil fraud. So, and there's some reasons for that. Particularly in 2014, um, a bacteria started, well first there was hot weather in the EU, such as there has been this summer. There's been heat waves and fires. And so that's been um, slashing the crops so the poor trees can't grow the fruit. So in the particular case in 2014, their crops um, were down to 40%. And so then a bacteria came. And this is killing the centuries old trees, particularly in Italy. And so that's um, a huge effect because they're actually bulldozing these, the whole olive groves in Italy. And some of these olive trees have been around since the Roman time. So that means there's a lot less trees growing fruit and the, fruit, the trees that are still there are really affected by the heat. So when there's a shortage of olive, then there'll be a shortage of olive oil. So the price goes through the roof. Then people start thinking about what can they do to make sure they meet their contracts with the oil that they've got. So the easiest thing they can do is falsely label them as coming from a region that has a higher price. And in this case, so this was in 2016, but similar things happen every year. And in this case, the entire supply chain, the 50 different individuals and organisations from the millers, the bottlers and the traders were all involved in... Um, fraudulently labelling the product. And how this was picked up was DNA testing of the olive oil. And in Italy now, they, they have set up, the easiest name is to say, a food fraud police force. It's got a very long name, the Ministry of Agriculture's Inspectorate for the Protection, Quality and Repression of Fraud in Agriculture and Food. But they're very proactive in going and looking for any fraud out there, they have access to fabulous testing and they are finding, every month they're finding fraud in all aspects of Italian food. 
So, but it hasn't just affected the olive oil in Italy and Spain. In 2018, the entire global production of olive oil dropped by 5% due to bad weather and disease across the whole of the world, including California. So Italy had a drop in production of up to 57%. Part of that is because I've had to bulldoze these trees. Greece and Portugal also had a drop from 35 to 15%. Um, Portugal had pest issues, and with the result of this, like the prices have skyrocketed, such as 40% in Canada. The pure olive oil has been cut with other oils, such as palm oil, sunflower, or canola. And you think, oh, well, the lab should be able to test for that. But when it's highly processed oil, lower grade oil, being blended in with processed olive oil, it's quite difficult for the labs to separate them out. So this is an interesting one. As we said, the seafood industry is always on the top five list for um, food fraud. And this was the largest survey that's ever been done, carried out in 2017 in the US, covering 21 states. And it, they covered 1,200 different seafood samples and then DNA tested them. So they found that 33% of that 1,200 were mislabeled. In the most, well, they mostly concentrated on seven, eight different fish types. So they're probably the most common at a retail level um, of fish, particularly salmon would be the number one sold. So out of that lot, Napa was mislabeled 87% of the time, following with tuna almost 60% of the time. And out of the 120 red snapper samples collected, only seven were correctly labelled. So the sushi shops, the sushi restaurants are the most likely to mislabel their fish more than the grocery stores or restaurants. Now this is really interesting. Those of you living in Chicago, Austin, New York or Washington DC, every single sushi restaurant sample sold mislabeled tuna. Um, now, out of this lot, most of these have no food safety risk whatsoever. But there's a particular product that you see usually only in the US called white tuna. White tuna does not exist. It is another fish that um, I think it's probably what we call orange ruffy here in Australia or escalar in other parts of the world. And they controlled prolonged uncontrollable, explosive, oily orange diarrhea. So that's pretty gross. And so, yes, yeah, they're the things that it's so common and it's everywhere. Here's a really, this court case has happened really recently in the last couple of weeks. So he was definitely charged as guilty. So this was a crab company, I think, based on the east coast of the USA. And he replaced Atlantic blue crab with crab meat from all over the world, particularly from Southeast Asia and South America. So they falsely labelled almost 400,000 pounds of crab meat as blue Atlantic crab product of the United States. And he directly, this, so the owner of the company directly um, told his employees to remove the foreign crab meat from the original packing containers blend them, combine them with um, crab meat that was from the US, repack them, relabel them. And so that's one of the most common types of fraud that can be there. And it was obviously very profitable. Now we've all heard about the melamine in the milk powder, but there's a lot more other fraud happening out there. So this is in China and this is where this was in 2016, where product that was milk powder made in New Zealand and the packet, it had expired, but instead of being destroyed, it was then repackaged into smaller packages and put onto the online marketplaces and sold below market prices. And they know at least 200 tonnes of the 300 tonnes were sold. Um, so 
another really easy way to do fraud. Just get old product, repackage it, relabel it, and particularly selling it via e-commerce. But milk scandals didn't start in China or even India, where they're quite common. If you Google the swill milk scandal in New York City in the 1850s, that's another really epic case of food fraud. Now, once again, organic for food is so often frauded. Once again, you just really have to change the label. And it's not you can't even do the DNA testing. It's a lot more sophisticated to find out the testing. And obviously, the organic fraud has a higher um, retail price. This is a case in the US in 2016 where organic soybeans were imported from the Ukraine to Turkey to California. They weren't organic. They started, um, they'd been fumigated with pesticide, which of course is not allowed if they're going to be organic. But by the time they turned up to California, they had been labelled organic. They had matching receipts, invoices and shipping records. So that added approximately $4 million to the value of those soybeans. And at least 21 million pounds of these soybeans were sold. Now the interesting thing here is, between 2014 and 16, the amount of organic corn arriving from the US from Turkey rose from just 15,000 tonnes up to almost 400,000 tonnes. And the amount of organic soybeans have risen from coming from Turkey from 14,000 to 165,000 tonnes. Now remembering that a country like Turkey really doesn't grow much corn or soybean. And that's probably the question that your purchasing guys need to ask. In that two years, a country like Turkey can't suddenly be producing 400,000 tonnes of corn any corn, let alone organic corn. So Turkey's just the middleman. They're sourcing these products from other countries, basically probably relabeling them. So under the USDA rules though, any company importing an organic product into the US must verify it has come from a supplier that has USDA organic certification and keeps receipts and invoices. But it doesn't have to be able to trace the product back to the farm. So of course, it's pretty easy to magic up receipts and invoices and organic certificates. So in this case, and this investigation was undertaken by journalists at the Washington Post, they identified that the soybeans originated from ADM in Ukraine, which is a massive country, company that many of you will know, and they confirmed that they do not produce or trade in organic soybeans, did not sell or label them as, much, as such. Now, the company that did um, sell the soybeans in the US, stopped selling them as soon as this became public. But the import of the product um, still insisted that they were legit legitimately organic. And the difference in the price per tonne went from $360 a tonne up to $600 when they um, were deemed to be organic, which they weren't. Now, that so that was um, imported products coming to the US. So this one, once again, is quite organic corn and soybeans, but they were grown in Nebraska. Now the farmers knew that they weren't grown as organic, but they were sold as organic. And so these guys did eventually get caught and were, they pleaded guilty to felony wire fraud. And the reason that, why they didn't say anything was they, this scam went on for seven years and made it almost $11 million. So yeah, it's very profitable. And so, you know, people ask me, like in my presentation last year, lots of people said, oh, if I just buy products that's made in the US and not imported from China and India, will I be okay? Well, no, you won't. These three farmers in Nebraska made themselves $11 million. So, Honey and maple syrup are always on the top forwarded list. There's been lots of scandals here in Australia about this. Um, so honey can be substituted with 
lots of different things. So sugar syrups the easiest, but there's also rice syrups, corn syrups, um, various different types of sh sugar syrups. And then maple syrup has just got a phenomenal industry of substitution. So yeah, in, so in 2001, the US Federal Trade Commission imposed tariffs on Chinese honey to stop it being imported and then blended in with honey in the US. We've had similar issues here in Australia. Um, and I'm sure it's cu your current government is certainly whacking some tariffs on there. And I could just spend a day just talking about honey substitution. As I said, we've had a lot of cases here in Australia. But some of the spice industry is probably some of the oldest fraud in the world, since the days of the silk routes on camels going to the Roman Empire. Um, there was fraud, and there's still fraud. So talking about a food safety risk, this is a case of the adulteration causing food safety risk. So this was in across from, I think, 2014 to 16, so it went for a couple of years. There were 67 different human-related recalls across the world, 15 of them in the UK, two in the EU, and 47 in the United States covering 675 different food products and three in Canada. So really interestingly, there were none in Australia or New Zealand, but there's absolutely no way that we didn't get some of this cumin in this country. So they, what happened was there was undeclared tree nuts and peanuts in the cumin that was supplied from Turkish brokers but most likely sourced from India, but they couldn't trace it back. And the reason this happened was that the products had been dilute, the cumin had been diluted down with ground almond or peanut shell. So it wasn't the actual nuts that were diluted in, it was their husks or shells, but they still had the allergen in them. And in some cases it was up, the allergen content was up to 100,000 parts per million, so a massive level of substitution. So it was found first in North America in late 2015. And then there was a cascade of recalls across North America that then made the UK authorities and the EU authorities start testing. And they found both peanut and almond contamination. Interestingly, in Canada, the, the situation there ended up not being contaminated with nuts, but with um, ground up cherry seeds, very specific type of cherries. And that what they found out there was when they did the lab test, it was positive. It came up positive as a cashew. Turns out this type of cherry is related to a cashew, and that's why the test was positive, but it wasn't. So it was still food fraud, but maybe not an allergen. Why it happened was in 2014 to 15, once again, the harvest failed in India and they, only, they had 50% less cumin than they normally would. And now cumin is the most commonly used spice in the EU. So even if they only added 1% of peanut shells, they would be adding up, up to $400 for sale of 10 tonnes. But we know that they were adding a lot more because some samples had up to 100,000 parts per million tree nuts. So, we could go on all day with different types of fraud substitutions in the spice industry, but what I wanted to show in terms of the, how widespread it can be, so this was one individual working in the city of Hyderabad in India, and he was adulterating black pepper, poppy seeds, cumin and caraway seeds. But he was supplying up almost 21,000 kilos of substituted product every month into wholesale merchants in this particular bazaar. You might think, oh, well, that's still some obscure bazaar in somewhere in India. Hyderabad is the centre of spice processing for the whole world. So if there's this much sub adulterated product coming into Hyderabad every single month, that means it's going across the whole planet. So on top of that, he was also supplying 15,000 kilos every month to traders in two other major Indian cities, including Delhi, the capital and Raipur. And he did this 
by supplying them at 75% the market rate, then everybody within the supply chain could add 5 or 10% profit. And he was paying off the transporters and various other logistics people along the supply chain. So what that shows us with that one is that everyone in the supply chain is profiting, even if it's by an additional 5 or 10%. So they're not going to say anything. But they know that it's different and they know it's cheaper, but it enables them to make more profit. So fruit juice, it's particularly the more expensive fruit juices, more unusual fruit juices are often substituted, particularly if there's a product claim such as pomegranates and various juices out of South America. So let's say looking at the pomegranates, it takes seven years to grow a tree until it's ready to fruit. So in the meantime, where did all those pomegranates come from? Usually they're just water, sugar and dye. Now, often some really common juices are substituted. So orange juice and apple juice, which are probably the two most common fruit juices on the whole planet, they are substituted into various other juices with combination, with syrup added, paprika or um, extract to add colour, beet sugar and apple juice is everywhere. And then it's been had added grape juice, that's another common juice that's added, corn syrup, pear, pineapple juice, all these other things are added to juice. And once again, the legal definition of fruit juice country to country is quite different. So people often ask me of what countries, what regions of the world are at risk of food fraud. Yes, we can find many examples out of China or the subcontinent such as India and Pakistan, and obviously a lot of the ones I've shown you today here are from Turkey. But it's everywhere. There's Every month we've got cases coming out of Italy and Spain. The saffron cases that have been identified in the UK this week have actually, the fraud was carried out in Spain. All across the EU or European Union, there's fraud. United States, Australia and New Zealand, we have fraud. It's everywhere. But you can see that often the shortages and the price rises are caused by droughts or storms such as the storms that are raging across like cyclones and hurricanes raging across Asia at the moment are going to have an effect. So we must con consider climate change. More climate change is cursed. The shortage of crops will have the prices will rise. Then you've got things like trade wars that are currently happening between US and China. That causes artificial shortages and price rises and then price falls in other markets. Areas with political instability, such as Syria because of civil war, or Venezuela because of political instability, also causes food shortages. So places like Syria used to grow a lot of food, but now the people are literally starving. So Anthony has asked, where you source your food supply should not be a critical part as in the food fraud equation as where you sell. Well, they're both important. Because if you're buying dodgy products from dodgy suppliers, you've got far more chance of having food fraud on your floor. But then you also need to know the laws in the different countries you're selling to because, as I said, in some cases what is legal in one country is not legal in another country. So what does a food fraud assessment look like? No, it does not look like your hazard risk assessment. And that's a really important thing. As an auditor, I see lots of people are just using their HACCP plan, their HACCP risk assessment methodology to um, shove in sub food fraud. You need to look at a different type of risk assessment, and that's what we're going to look at here. Particularly, severity is not a particularly useful measure because the product, no matter what it's substituted with, is illegal and it won't meet the customer specifications because it's got an ingredient in there that it shouldn't have or is missing an ingredient that it should have. And not all of the cases have a food safety concern. Now, some of the ones we've seen here do, such as the cumins with allergens in them. 
but some of the others like the soybeans and the corn they weren't organic but they were safe and anyone could consume them without any risk it just wasn't what the customer was paying for so here's a method that I've devised and I've used it as I said on at least probably more than 600 ingredients now looking at likelihood they're still really relevant um, so use a scoring system so I've used the basic one to five so five represents a frequency of once a day hopefully that's not occurring or down to one an improbable event once every five years instead of severity I'm using a variable called detectability so once again a one to five scoring system of five being no detection controls are applied at all up to one will be detected a detection procedure is applied frequently and is reliable to some of my clients I've had to give this entire score because some of my clients have had absolutely no detection applied to the raw materials not doing any um, assessments when they're coming in not they've got approved suppliers but that's all and they're not looking at the risk of food fraud so in that particular client lots of the raw material assessments we did had a detectability score of five but then I've got other clients who check every single batch of every single raw material at receival they do a sensory evaluation look at the taste te the smell the feel and get C of A's or lab results which every single delivery so they have a high chance of detecting any potential fraud then there's the profitability so this relates to how valuable is the raw material you're buying so let's say if it's saffron obviously there's a massive profit to be made in that but if it's another product let's say like tapioca or rice flour there's a the price is much lower and so the profitability is only a score of one so then you and under each of these there's different areas that you need to look at so the likelihood is based on the historic incidences and any emerging issues you know about changes in prices how complicated is your supply chain where is your product originally coming from is it easy to access the raw materials along that supply chain is it a dried or minced product so much easier to adulterate than a whole intact product detectability is all about the control measures that are already applied either by your business or by somebody in the supply chain so I talked about some of those things um, tamper proof packaging is a good thing in this section and then profitability is all about the price um, is it complex to commit the fraud or is it easier is it easy cheap substitutes that you can put in there then once you've got the scores in the three different variables you multiply them together so you could end up with a score between 1 and 125 obviously if you get a score of 125 you've got a real serious problem the highest score that I've ever had in the assessments I've done is I think about 70 so here's some examples that I've done so I've done dried cinnamon now for at least four different clients and I've ended up with different scores and that's because of the detectability so we know that the likelihood of substitution in cinnamon is going to be pretty high it's got a long history of substitution and in the cases that we know specifically we know in 2015 along with the cumin there was also cases of cinnamon that were uh, had undeclared tree nut allergens and in 2016 70% of samples of cinnamon bark taken from India were found to be adulterated India is a major source of cinnamon 2013 more than 50% of Danish bakery items were found to have illegal levels of cumin which is the active ingredient not just in cinnamon but also a product called cassia which is often used as substitute of cinnamon so the cinnamon and cassia trees grow very closely together in the same environment um, they have very similar colors and smells but the price of cassia is far below that of cinnamon and they both as I said 
that we import in large quantities from India and China. They don't, the cinnamon doesn't grow in China. Obviously cinnamon has a long shelf life, it's available in the dried form, and it has a complex supply chain, often grown in one country, processed in another country, ground in another country, and sold in a fourth country. This particular case that I did, the um, client I had was doing no retained samples, no assessments on receival. They did not receive a certificate of assurance from their supplier and they did not carry out any testing themselves. And they didn't even know the country of origin and their supplier wouldn't tell them. So the likelihood we know of from the history, the cinnamon of substitution is pretty high, so it's a score four. And in this case, this particular client will have no chance of detecting anything because they know almost nothing, well they know nothing about the real supplier. They are not doing any controls whatsoever. So that's a score five. Profitability, it's an average profitability. It's not huge, it's not up there with Saffron. So but and you multiply those four numbers together and you get a score of 60, which is pretty high. So the client in question decided they will get a completely different supplier that cost a bit more but would provide them with not just where did it come from but GFSI certificates and lab reports through the whole chain. Here's one from my case study I did last year in the SQF conference for powdered turmeric. So we know that numerous different things are being used to um, dilute turmeric including lead, chromate, which is I think a paint, Menantil yellow, which is a dye, cassava starch, which is a root vegetable that sometimes if it's not treated right, it's got some toxins in it, and then wheat powder, flour. So the emerging issues with this product is it's a really in there as a superfood. People are drinking turmeric lattes and smoothies all over the world. So this has increased the price, particularly for the active ingredient in the turmeric called curcumin. Now, in 2016 17, the monsoon rains failed to come to parts of India, so the market was flooded with really low quality turmeric that they'd stored from the previous season, and that had a low curcumin content. So, the, in this particular case, all the products were sourced from India. The company had, so we know that there's a medium chance of history of fraud in turmeric particularly because of it's now deemed to be a superfood. There's been recalls recently as 2016 in the US for lead chromate. Um, but this client had a lot of assessment in place, entry evaluation of every delivery, in lab reports for every delivery. Um, so it may not pick up everything, but they had a good chance of picking up at least the symptoms of when it could be frauded. So that was a score of two. And once again, it's not as expensive as something like saffron, but it's still profit to be made. Um, and so you multiply these three and you get a score of 18. So much lower than the previous one of 60. And a large part of that is due to the detectability. This is where you can see your mitigation plans, your control measures can make a huge difference to your final score in your VASIP. So here we come to one with a really low score of tapi with the tapioca starch. One of the reasons is there's no profitability to be made. It's a really cheap ingredient um, and so it's just no money. So no one would substitute anything because there's probably not much you could substitute in that would be cheaper than tapioca starch in the first place. It's a white powder. You could add lots of things, and but there's just no money, so nobody would. What happens is tapioca is used to put into lots of other things as a substitute. And in this particular case, we had GFSI certificates back to the source manufacturer. They didn't have any, weren't taking samples or doing tests, but they did have lab tests for every batch received. So the likelihood rating is one, just no history. Detectability, they had some things in place, they might pick it up, three, 
but there's no margin, or almost no margin. So you multiply those, you end up with um, six. So if you end up with a score of six out of a potential of 125, there is no reason why you should be adding any more mitigation plans, any more control measures, because this is about as low as it can get. But if you had a score of 60, you should be putting some control measures in place. So where do you get all this information? Well, you can spend your entire life on Google. Um, there's various recall notices around the world that you can be sent to your email every day. Numerous countries also have what they call border rejection notices. So the EU has that, Australia has that, the FDA and USDA have that. Interestingly, the Indian government have a website for their Department of Ag that um, tracks the commodity prices for products coming out of there. There's some newspapers who are particularly onto this, particularly the Times of India, Washington Post, probably the only one still left with investigative journalists there. And people ask me, where do we find information about prices? My go-to site is Alibaba Wholesale. Yep, the products are, the prices are quoted by the tonne, but it gives you an idea of whether it's a cheap commodity or a horrendously expensive one. I can see the SQF ladies are chatting about various different um, sub products I've heard are substituted, such as avocado. Yes. Avocados are highly substituted. Where do you draw the line on what score and on mitigating actions? That's a great question, Mike. I get asked this one all the time. I haven't drawn a particular red line across my matrix. Each client decides that on their own. But what I have found in all my different assessments I've done, there ends up being one or two products that absolutely sticks up with a much higher score than the others. So for some clients, that score might be 60 or 70. Other clients, that score might be 48 or 36. But there's always one or two ingredients that are at much greater risk than the rest of their ingredients. And so that's what I get people to concentrate on, those one or two products that are the ones that are really standing out. They're the ones that you need to put a control plan in. For many of my clients, most of their scores are 24 or below. And in that case, you don't really need to. You could choose to add in some extra assessments or ask for more C of A's, but there's no hard and fast rule. So if you don't want to spend your life on Google and being inundated with emails from government departments around the planet, you can get a subscription to a number of different databases out there. So one we work with is Horizon Scan, which is designed by scientists in the UK, and they too will send you emails every day, but you can access their database. So here's a search that I've done um, for turmeric when I was doing my case study last year, and you can see that um, they've got numerous different uh, substitutions, 2017 and then going back. So they've got at least more than 10 years of records in this database. So you get emails, so here's some examples of honey adulteration in the Czech Republic, more olive oil adulteration in Spain and Morocco. Um, so here's an update that I got last year about turmeric containing rice and starch. So this is a hazard that had already been, contaminants that had been identified previously and it's a very cheap product that can be added to turmeric. So that's not the only database, there's another one out there called foodfraud.org, you also have to pay for this. You can get similar information, so we can he see here that turmeric, yep, there was rice flour substitution in 2012, um, a wide range, you know, that. so if you pay to use any of these uh, databases, it would just make your life so much easier faster and you know that you'll get a lot more information than just randomly hitting Google. So here's another one Christy's put up called securingindustry.com and so I'll have to start looking at that one. As I said, there's some media outlets um, are really focusing on this 
and constantly have updates. So in my turmeric case study, some of the thing, information that was supplied, so this case study we had two suppliers of what we thought was the same product that had failed at that initial receival assessment because it didn't look right, smell right, feel right. So what the suppliers had already supplied were their GFSI certificates. So in this case, the first wholesaler supply had SQF. Um, they supplied a very detailed product specification, what we call in this country a PIF. And then we, they'd also supplied a BASIP assessment they had done, but this assessment they'd done did not actually have a risk ranking. And they also supplied a lab result covering the micro, Sudan 1, 2, 3 and 4, which are various colouring agents, and the curcumin content, which is, as I said, the active ingredient. The second supplier, Wholesaler B, had supplied the GFSI certificates not just for themselves, but also for the processor in India. So they had BRC certificates down the supply chain. Once again, they supplied a product specification. They had done a VASIP assessment on this product and ranked it as medium risk, but they felt that they were fairly likely that um, any food fraud would be detected. They had a certificate of analysis and this was supplied by the processors in India. So that was sensory evaluation, micro, the sedan colours, term and content. So this processor had a lot of um, documentation supplied by their suppliers, a lot more than most people. Now what we had identified was in the end of the case study that the two products supplied from these different wholesalers was actually different products. And each of the products supplied matched the product specification. Um, they didn't exactly match what we'd say the textbook specification for the curcumin content. And now the interesting thing there is if we go back to see what documents were supplied, we'll see that the wholesaler B supplied it for what they call Madras turmeric, and wholesaler A, um, their specification called it Aleppi turmeric. These are the same plant, but grown in different areas and different parts of the plant process, so the end product is different. Now, my client hadn't realised there were different types of turmeric. And in this case, so Blender A is my client, they didn't use the turmeric for its curcumin content but for its colour. So they didn't really care about the curcumin content and they decided they would just buy from wholesaler B because they provided the product they wanted. And then further down in the supply chain that we looked at, after my client, who they sold it to Blender B, who make curry specific custom blend curry mixes. And looking at the evidence there, in, through that supply chain, it would look like that Blender B was adding either rice flour or wheat flour to their curry powders because it was positive for gluten. And the interesting thing here, so at this point, through the different wholesalers and blenders, what we're seeing is possibly a substitution of Blender B in the curry mix, but most people would say, okay, well, we've got gluten in the product that's not labelled. That could be, that's an allergen, so that could be a food safety risk at this point. But further down the supply chain, it got a much higher food safety risk because this curry powder was then used, was added to tuna that was um, canned. And the problem there was <clears throat> the buyer of a, you know, the tuna cannery was assuming that there was no gluten in its spice mix and if they had known there was gluten, they would have to recalculate the retort specification because adding um, starch or gluten into a retort because it has a huge effect on the time and temperature um, parameters. So 
So what it would mean is potentially that the canning process would not work because of the retort calculation. Now on this basis we looked at different things, looked at different types of starches and even the type of starch has a different effect on the end retort calculation. And in this case we think that was probably substituted with tapioca because that's the cheapest type of starch you can add in, not potato starch. So tapioca starch has relatively no effect um, on the final retort calculation. And what made us decide this is we looked at the price of tapioca starch versus potato starch and tapioca starch is only $500 a tonne, whereas potato starch is $1,500 a tonne. So this is another thing that's really different from HACCP is um, making sure you do know about the prices going up, going down, what is most likely to be substituted because of the value and the profit margin. So we, most QA teams don't even have access to the information, so you need to have your purchasing people on your BASIP team. Now, if we remember the um, suppliers of the turmeric said that they were, one of them said that they were fairly confident that they would detect any fraud that was in place. Well, no one in the supply chain was testing their product for starch or gluten. Oh. They were testing it for things like coloured dyes, in some cases heavy metals. So it would not have been detected in the supply chain. Once again, my um, clients, they really needed to read their product specification and realise that they were buying two different products. And a major emerging issue with the turmeric case is that often the curcumin content is extracted to be used in other products such as lattes and smoothies and the yellow coloured powder is sold as turmeric but it doesn't have that active ingredient or at a really low level. So you need to understand the differences in similar products and does that have an effect on your process and your product and does it have an effect on your customer's use of that product. So what are your steps? What do you need to do? First up, list every raw material. Collect information on every single raw material. Basically set up a giant spreadsheet. Look at your, who are you buying off? Is that a broker? Is that an agent? Where is the source manufacturer or supplier of your product? Are the pricing trends going up, going down? What known testing is happening throughout the supply chain? What sampling is happening? Make sure you have all the current certification information from your brokers and agents all the way down your supply chain. And a really low tech thing of how to do this is go downstairs into your warehouse on your production floor and actually read your cartons. Read the labels. Are they, have they got S2F logos on their carton? Look at the information being on the lab report. That's how we picked up some, who some of the suppliers were in India. They'd paid for the lab reports and the name and addresses were on those lab reports we supplied. Often the brokers won't supply you with, let's say, the GFSI certificates, but they'll give you a kosher or halal certificate, which also has the names and addresses of the source manufacturer. See, lots of people talk about blockchain. Blockchain is not going to solve the world's food fraud problem. It's pretty expensive and there's a lot of low-tech things you can do like read cartons, lab reports and halal and kosher certificates for names and addresses. Now that you've collected all the information that you've got on your raw materials, put them in a huge supply spreadsheet, start assessing those raw materials for past um, issues of food fraud um, and yes you need to look at that for each raw material. Now sometimes you can group them together. Now the other piece of information you need to know is about price change and changes in availability of raw material. This is where you need to have your purchasing guys talking to them, asking them about are the prices going up, are they going down, is there a glut, is there a shortage. As I said, you can group some ingredients together 
if they're similar types of products with the same core ingredient, um, if they're coming from the same manufacturer, so you might be buying different types of cinnamon from the same supplier in Sri Lanka, you might be getting a dried product, a bark product. And, yeah, what type of certifications are in your supply chain? Now, not all certificates out there do require a food fraud assessment. Um, the ones that do are the GFSI or Global Food Safety Initiative benchmark standards, such as SQF8, BRC8, FSC22000 version 4.1. But if you're getting a generic CASIP certificate or an ISO 9000 or even an ISO 22000, they don't necessarily need to look at food fraud, and they won't have. So it's, this is not about food safety, it's about food fraud. So know what those certificates mean. Rank your scores. Now, I know FISMA and SQF don't explicitly state that you need to rank them. Certain retailers, particularly here in Australia, explicitly state that you do need to rank your hazards. But it certainly makes it easier for you to present a case to your top management that you need extra resources if you can say, hey, we've ranked them and two raw materials have come up with a score of 60 and 70, we've got some problems we need to deal with now. Implement additional control measures, which could be simply as doing a receivable inspection. What does each ingredient look like, taste like, feel like, smell like against a master sample? Document your procedures. Keep records of these assessments. When you find an incident that you think is food fraud, that you do an investigation and root cause analysis, keep the records and build that back into your scoring system. Keep looking on the horizon for any emerging issues, or what I call trigger points for action, and review regularly. Keep records of every review you do, because your auditor is going to be asking for that. I think I've just gone over time. So if you need to contact me, um, there's my email, there's my company's website. And as I said, I do consulting. I carry out BAS assessments for people. Um, and then we do training, including we have online modules. And if you go onto our website, and particularly the module four of our BAS assessment online training, has downloadable um, documents, all the documents that I talked about here, the spreadsheet, the VASIP matrix, the worksheets, they're all there. If you buy module four, um, you get them all. So what, Mark's got a question? Um, yeah, he agrees that most sites aren't testing incoming materials, but having certificates is guaranteed. Now that's a very United States thing. The rest of the planet does not have guarantees. They're not worth anything. Um, so most sites are relying on their food fraud procedure and letters. Well, that's just rubbish. The letters mean absolutely nothing. They said the rest of the planet never has letters of guarantee. Um, at the very least, get a fact specific lab report. And their rankings based on certificates and complaints. Well, that's the most superficial level. Yep, you can start with that, but they're really the complaints aren't an indicator of food fraud. Most of your customers don't even know that food fraud is a thing out there. Um, so, and lots of your marketing people who might receive your complaints might think, oh, it's the wrong colour today. Oh, it doesn't feel right, doesn't smell right. Let's just give them a refund and a new batch of product. So the QA people may not even know that that was a complaint and they may not in my experience, most of them are unaware of the symptoms of food fraud, let alone the action trigger points that they should be looking at to be proactive in this area. So, yep, Mark, the most, so with the GFSI standards, everybody, whether you had BRC, SQF, or FSC 22000 or the like, had to do a food fraud assessment last year. This year, everybody should be reviewing those food fraud assessments, putting additional controls, getting a lot more proactive in that space. And in the meantime, the auditors also have had quite a bit of training in the last 12 months. 
So, any more burning questions? Last chance to get the information directly from Claire. Well, not seeing any other questions. You have Claire's contact information there, and I know she is also on LinkedIn. Um, yep. My goodness, Claire, that information is, is absolutely fascinating. I've already decided I'm going to listen to this entire webinar over again because there was just so much good information. So that being said, we will post this webinar on LinkedIn to anyone who wants to share this with a colleague. Um, it will be um, maybe by the end of the week, definitely by next week. So you just go to YouTube and search for SQFI and you'll see this webinar. Thank you, Claire, so much for your expertise. Um, and your, your um, great case study examples. We really appreciate this. This was just wonderful information and um, definitely good information for our food fraud toolbox. Thank you so much, uh, Claire, and um, thanks to all of you for participating. And with that, we'll let you head into your day. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. And I did write an article for Sarah at SQF about um, my case study last year at turmeric, on the turmeric. Oh, in, right. So I think um, she'll probably be publishing that somewhere on the SQF um, website, I'd say, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so anyone wants detailed information on that case study, we've also got a recording of my presentation on our company's website in the blog, um, if anyone's interested in that one. Thanks for mentioning no, that. Um, I'm sorry, I completely forgot to mention that. Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay, so I love talking on this topic, so send me emails, contact me on LinkedIn, and I'll answer your questions. All right.